right, guys, welcome back to our case of Econ Struggles. Welcome to another asset pricing struggle. Today, we're going to start talking about Lucas Tree asset pricing. This is going to be part one of two. Let's go ahead and get right into it. So the goals of this video, again, I'm going to split this into two parts just because when I try to do it as one, it got pretty lengthy. So in the first part of this video, what we're going to do is we're just going to understand the setup of the Lucas Tree model, and then we're going to derive the price for the Lucas Tree asset or share. That's going to be part one. Then in part two, we'll find the price for the risk-free bond, and then we'll find the relative return of the stock versus the bond in the Lucas Tree model. So as always, timestamps are below if you would like to jump around. But let's go ahead and get right into it. So here is the Lucas Tree setup. We're going to have a person or a representative agent, and per usual, our representative agent is going to be Bill. So Bill is going to live for T periods. It could be infinity, but for now, we'll just say T. He gets to consume a certain amount of coconuts in every period. So that's going to be CTB. He's going to have a utility. And then what he's going to get is he's going to get a certain share of coconuts from this coconut tree. So this Lucas tree is going to be a coconut tree. You can see it looks nothing like a coconut tree, but I promise you it is indeed a coconut tree in some world where coconuts are red. And so this right here is just going to be that the share of coconuts of the tree that Bill gets. So we'll talk about that more in a second. And Bill can buy shares. He can buy more shares of the tree tomorrow for a price PT. And of course, the other thing that he can do is there's a risk-free bond called BTB that Bill can hold. It costs PTRF or a risk-free bond price for Bill to buy for the next period. But we're going to talk mostly about that in part two. So for the coconut tree or the Lucas tree, what's going to happen every period, it's going to grow a certain number of coconuts. It's going to be a random number of coconuts. And the number of coconuts that Bill gets from that tree on a given day is basically the share that he owns of the tree. So for example, maybe I'll just do this right here. So for example, suppose that Bill's share of the coconut tree is like 0.5. He owns 50% of the fruit that comes off the coconut tree in a given day. And suppose that on a given day, the amount of coconuts that grow on the tree are 10, then that means that Bill is going to get a whopping five coconuts from his shares of the fruit tree or the coconut tree. And that's sort of how this works. And so if Bill wants to increase the share, he can buy more of these shares for tomorrow. If he buys more of those shares, he's going to get more of the fruit. He's going to get a higher percentage of the fruit that comes off the tree in a given period. So hopefully this makes sense. If the setup is a little confusing right now, feel free to leave a comment below. But maybe when we write out the math, it's going to be a little easier to figure out what's going on. So, of course, Bill's problem. Bill's going to live for T periods. And in the background, we're sort of thinking about if Bill lives forever. But basically what Bill wants to do is he wants to maximize his expected lifetime utility. And his utility only revolves around or only involves the coconuts that he gets to eat. And he's got some discount factor beta. And so this looks pretty standard from models that we've seen before. The budget constraint is going to look a little different than we're used to. We've got these amount of coconuts that Bill is going to eat. He can purchase shares of the tree tomorrow. He can also purchase risk-free bonds for tomorrow. So those are the things that he can choose to buy. So maybe this is sort of like coconut spent because we don't have money in this economy. And so it's not like he's got dollars. So we're thinking about everything in terms of coconuts. So all the prices are in terms of coconuts. And then, of course, these are like the coconuts he has, or the coconuts, I don't know, wallet seems like a weird term, but they're the coconuts in his wallet, slash that he has, because he's Bill. And so what you can see is, again, on any given day, I'm choosing how much to eat, I'm choosing how many shares of this tree I want to buy for tomorrow, I'm choosing how many risk-free bonds I want to buy for tomorrow. What I have is I get the share of fruit that falls off of this coconut tree today, I also get one coconut per bond that I purchased yesterday. And then I also have the value of my shares because what I could do is I could always choose to sell my shares to someone else. And if I choose to sell my shares, then I'm going to get some coconuts for selling the shares. And so that's always an option. And so this is sort of like the wealth that I have in terms of the share of coconuts that I'm going to get in any given period. So we have that. And all I'm going to do is I'm just going to take this OT and this OT and combine them together and so that the worth of my shares is both the dividends and the price of my shares today. So again, just to rehash, PTOT is the value of my shares if I choose to sell them, so I have that as wealth. And DTOT is the value of the fruit I get based on the shares because DT is how much fruit the coconut tree dropped today. 
and OT is the percent of that fruit that I get based on how many shares I own of this coconut tree. Again, if this is still confusing, leave a comment below. But now we're pretty much all ready to set this up as a Lagrangian and start finding out the price of this share, the price of OT. So all I'm gonna do, just per usual, I'm gonna set up the Lagrangian with the Lagrangian multiplier. This is the same constraint we saw earlier, just set equal to zero. And now I'm gonna take some first order conditions. And specifically, I'm gonna take the first order conditions with respect to OT plus one and CT. OT plus one, because I wanna find the price of this thing, so that's gonna be useful if I have the first order condition. And then CT, because as we've seen in other asset pricing videos, the price that I'm willing to pay is gonna be based upon how much consumption or my marginal utility of that consumption in a given period. And so I know I'm gonna need those things. Also, I know I can set them equal to some version of lambda and put those into my first order condition for OT plus one. So maybe just to go a little slower, if I start with my first order condition with respect to OT plus one, or with respect to the amount of shares I choose to have in the next period, well, today it's just PT, because here's OT plus one. And then in the next period, if I were to move this whole constraint forward one period in time, then this would be lambda T plus one. This would be OT plus two, well, this would be minus dt plus one minus pt plus one. That would all be times ot plus one. So that's why it pops in right here. And now I have my normal first order conditions for ct. The only difference from what we've seen is it's an expectation. The reason I'm gonna keep this expectation in here is because this is for any period. So if I'm thinking about in the future, Really, today, this E would drop out if it's today, but for any other period, it's an expectation, so I'm just gonna leave those in. And so now all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna combine first order conditions. So again, here is the first order condition for OT plus one, and then I'm just gonna solve that for PT, and so I'm gonna get this expression here. When I plug in the first order conditions for CT and CT plus one, really there's a negative sign that came in here, but because it was a negative over a negative, I just went ahead and plus them out because I can do that. And so now we can start filling this in. And now notice that what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say, well, PT is therefore equal to just expectation because I can pull this out. Beta times this fraction, DT plus one plus PT plus one. Well, I can figure out what PT plus one is by pulling this whole equation forward one period. So all I'm gonna do is go from PT to PT plus one CT is gonna go CT plus one, and CT plus one will become CT plus two. And then all of these subscripts will get plus one to their time. And now I have this equation in terms of PT plus two. I can do the same thing again and write PT plus two, where again, I'm just moving forward one period in time. And then I'm just gonna substitute back and sort of start writing out this messy looking equation because this is gonna go on and on and on. And so you can see if I start writing it out, then I start with beta CT over CT plus one, DT plus one, and then PT plus one is just beta CT plus one, DT plus two. And then I'm just gonna go on and on and on. And so what's gonna happen in terms of the pattern, and I sort of condense this, but if this would be helpful to keep going with a few more steps to make it clear, again, let me know in the comments below and I can do that. But really what we're gonna get is we're gonna get that as we go on and on, if we go up to some period T or the end of Bill's life, then we're gonna get the expectation of the sum from tau equals one to T. Notice I'm using tau and not T. Of beta to the tau, C tau, C tau plus one, D T plus tau, which is going to take care of all of these guys. And then all we're gonna have left at the end is just the last period where we're gonna have P T plus big T. And so what we're going to have is we're gonna have this expression and we're not sure how to simplify it. But what we can do is if we say that PT is bounded, we take the limit as T goes to infinity, then what's gonna happen is because this guy is bounded right here, beta to the T is less than one, so this whole thing is gonna go to zero. And so if this whole thing goes to zero, then the limit as we go towards infinity is just gonna be the first part of that expression. And so we're gonna have this guy right here. And this is gonna be really useful and it makes a lot of sense for a couple reasons. Well, the first reason is that if we ignore the functional form we chose for our utility, which was the natural log of CT, then really what we had is beta to the tau times the marginal utility of consumption tomorrow 
or in the next period, divided by the marginal utility of consumption in the current period, which is just the marginal ratio of substitution between two different periods, times the future dividend payments in any future period. And so what we call this first bar right here is the stochastic discount factor because it's the present discounted value also discounted based on your marginal ratio of substitution times your future dividend payment. And so I've just written that out sort of right here. And really this makes a lot of sense because if you're thinking about how much you're willing to pay for a share of this coconut tree, well, you'd probably be willing to pay the value to you of all the future dividend payments in every period from now until you die, or now until infinity, as basically as long as you're gonna hold this share. And so what you wanna do is you wanna take the expected dividend that you're gonna get in every period from now off into the infinite future. You wanna discount it based on your time discount preferences. And you also wanna discount it based on if your marginal utility of consumption in a given day is gonna be really high compared to yesterday, or if your marginal utility of consumption is gonna be low in a given period relative to yesterday. Because you're gonna get a dividend in a plus one period, so if you buy the share today, you're gonna to get that consumption tomorrow, you also wanna discount it by how much utility it's going to give you, how much marginal utility it's gonna give you when you receive that dividend, as compared to when you purchase the share. So this is when you purchase the share, and this is when you get the dividend tomorrow. And so that also will discount the price, because if you're gonna get a lot of goods, if you're gonna have a lot of coconuts when you're gonna receive this dividend, it's not as worth it to you because your margin utility is gonna be pretty low. And so you have to take that into account in addition to your time discount factor. So that's why this asset formula makes a lot of sense. And this is the Lucas tree asset price for a share in the coconut tree. So again, in part two, we're gonna keep going. We're gonna talk about the risk-free bond. We're gonna talk about comparing the returns of this dividend and this risk-free bond. But if you've got questions or comments, please leave those below. If you haven't already, please subscribe and we'll see you next time for another case of Econ Struggles.